Well, good afternoon, everyone. I am Major General Mike Berry, the Adjutant General of the Delaware National Guard. It is a tremendous honor for me to welcome all of you to the Major Joseph R. Bo Biden III National Guard Reserve Center. It's been a pleasure to partner with the Wilmington Veterans Affairs Medical Center, not only today in hosting this PACT Act awareness event, but for the work that we are doing together to prevent suicide among veterans and our military service members. Our partnership is essential to getting veterans the access to health care and benefits they rightfully deserve. There is a new call to action where we must work together and spread the message to all veterans about the Sergeant First Class Heath Robinson honoring our promise to address Comprehensive Toxics Act. As members of our military deployed throughout the world in support of our nation, laws such as this are critical in the continuum of care that we are expected to provide on their behalf. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the Honorable Dennis McDonough. Before coming to the VA, he served as the 26th White House Chief of Staff and as Principal Deputy National Security Advisor. He believes deeply, as he testified to Congress, that there is no more sacred obligation nor noble undertaking than to uphold our promises to our veterans, whether they came home decades ago or days ago. Please join me in welcoming the 11th Secretary of Veterans Affairs, Dennis McDonald. Mr. President, good afternoon and welcome home. General Barry, thanks for that warm welcome and for your three decades of service and leadership. The Delaware Guard's been defending our freedom since long before our founding, whenever and wherever the country needs them. We all saw, we saw that kind of devotion in the actions of Texas met Recognized, recognized just last, just last Friday, Friday, with, Friday the with the Distinguished Flying Cross for his heroism in Afghanistan, responding to the tragedy at the Karzai International Airport a year ago August. And you're sending the 160th, 60th Engineer Company downrange come January to Kuwait. May God bless them, keep them safe. It's an honor to be here in this building at one of the last of 100, more than 100 events that we've been hosting at VA during the PACT Act Week of Action to our veterans, their families, caregivers, and survivors. We're forever in your debt, and we're fighting like hell to serve you as well as you have served us. My boss, the president, won't accept anything less. And thanks to the PACT Act, that President Biden signed on August 10th. VA, VA's expanded health care and benefits for millions of vets and their survivors is now real, including for so many of you in this building today. If you or a loved one served in the Vietnam era, the Gulf War era, or the post 9-11 era, you may be eligible for new or increased care and benefits because of the PACT Act. And here's what you need to know. First, apply for your benefits right now, right now. If you're enrolled in VA care already, get a quick and easy toxic exposure screening. If you're not enrolled, get enrolled, and we'll help you do that right here today. If you haven't yet applied for your PACT Act benefits, apply. You can do all of that here today in this building, or you can call the Delaware Office of Veteran Services at 302-739-2792 or make, a regional, uh, make an appointment with the VBA Regional Office, 302-994-2511, extension 4845. 
Second, VA will begin processing PACT Act claims on January 1st at the President's direction. That's the earliest date possible. And if you apply for PACT Act related benefits before August 10th next year, then your benefits will be backdated to August 10th, 2022, meaning you will be paid back to August 10, 2022, the day President Biden signed that bill into law. So get your claim signed as quickly as you can. Third, I know, because I've heard, that some vets are worried that applying for PACT Act benefits will impact their current benefits. The truth is the following. With the PACT Act, you are 32 times more likely to have your benefits increase than decrease. So please file your claims. Fourth, there's some people out there who fear that they need a lawyer or they need to pay somebody to apply for your, your VA benefits. We don't tolerate that. President Biden would not tolerate that. <laughs> Applying for your PACT Act benefits is free, it's easy, and by working directly with VA or with a Delaware State Veteran Service Organization or your county veteran service officer, you can get exactly what you need. Fifth, to learn more about the PACT Act, apply anytime at va.gov slash PACT or call us at 1-800-MY-VA-411. Join the nearly 190,000 veterans and survivors who have, already signed, who have already signed up for their benefits since the President signed that law. Whenever somebody signs up to serve our country in the military, we have what the President calls a sacred obligation to them and their families. We make them a promise. If you fight for us, we'll fight for you. If you take care of us, we'll take care of you. If you serve us, we'll serve you when you come home. Our nation as a whole makes that promise, but it's our mission here in Delaware and across the country to keep that promise to all veterans, their families, their caregivers, and survivors. The PACT Act will help us keep that promise, and President Biden is leading the way in keeping that promise. And we will not rest until every single veteran and survivor knows about this new law, understands what, what it means for them, and gets the care and benefits they've earned. That's what our country owes you. And that's what we will deliver to you. With that, it's my privilege to introduce someone who doesn't need a lot of introduction around these parts. <laughs> Senator Carper is the last serving Vietnam veteran in the United States Senate. He's given more than 40 years of devoted service and strong leadership to improving veterans' health care and services here in Delaware and across the country. Please join me in welcoming 23-year veteran of the Un United States Navy and Naval Reserves, Captain and Senator Tom Carper. Thanks. Put your hands together for our secretary. Go ahead. Dennis, it's great to, uh, to welcome you back to Delaware. Thank you so much for your leadership and for all you're doing. And I just want to say to the president, you could have picked a better guy or gal to, uh, for this uh, job. So thank you. Thank you for that. Chris and I got to vote for it, got to confirm it. Easiest nomination vote we had uh, all year. Easiest one. Well, I'm delighted to be here with our commander in chief of the state of Delaware, uh, John Carney. And go ahead. My wingman in the United States Senate, the Honorable Chris Coons. And if you're wondering, is there an honorable wing woman over in the House of Representatives? There sure is. And her name is Lisa Blunt Rochester. <laughs> Joe Barry, always great to be with you. His commander in chief is, is not the governor of Delaware, it's his wife, who's also a general <laughs> up in Connecticut for the, for the National Guard. Great to be with you, uh, General, uh, general Barry. And uh, we're especially pleased to be able to welcome home. 
especially pleased to be able to welcome home our friend, the President of the United States, Delaware, Ong Joe Biden. Many of you probably heard the, uh, the expression, if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear it, is there really a noise? Think about that. If a tree falls in the forest, there's no one there to hear it, is there really a noise? A similar question can be asked here today. The bill is enacted that provides life-saving, new health benefits for veterans, but none of them know that it exists. Do veterans and their families really benefit? To reiterate some of what uh, Se uh, Secretary McDonough has, has just laid out, and I thought you did a great job, just crisp right, right to, the, uh, to the point. Uh, this new law and these uh, new benefits will uh, only be game changers, will only be game changers if we, working together, get the word out about the PACT Act from sea to shining sea to our veterans, to their families here in Delaware and across the nation, and sign up, sign up for health care benefits that they've earned through their service. That's the key. The PACT Act, which uh, Senator Coons and I, Congresswoman Blunt Rochester, and I were proud to support earlier this year, along with the bipartisan majority of our, our colleagues in the House and the Senate, will expand access to VA health care for upwards of, listen to this, three and a half million post-9-11 veterans, many of whom were exposed to toxic burn pits in Iraq and Afghanistan and other conflict zones around the world. To put it bluntly, this bill is going to save lives, a lot of them. I've often heard our president say, and I'm sure our congressional delegation has as well, all politics is personal, and he adds that all diplomacy is personal. For him and for me, the, uh, the issues before us today are deeply personal ones. My father and uh, most of my uncles served in uh, uniform in World War II, one of them also served in Korea. My grandmother was a gold star mother. My mom's youngest brother, Bob Kidd Patton, was killed in action at the age of 19 on October 26, 1944, in a kamikaze attack in the Western Pacific on his aircraft carrier, the USS Swanee. His body was never recovered. There was, if you ever come to, to my office at 513 Hart, you walk into my personal office, there's a huge picture of him on the, on the wall in his uh, Navy uh, dress blues. He's just, he just made, uh, a, uh, he's a, a third class petty officer, he just, just made third class, great picture of him. And I'm reminded of him every day I walk into my office when I see his smiling face of his sacrifice and the sacrifice really of my grandparents. Growing up in a household with a strong military tradition, I also felt the call to serve our country and did so, as Dennis has said, for five years as a naval flight officer during the Vietnam War. And after my time on active duty ended, I took a new commission with the Naval Reserve, wound up flying with the Navy P-3 Squadron out of Willow Grove, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, just uh, not too far from where Jill Biden grew up. And the people say, what is a P-3? We use them for low-level missions off the coast of Vietnam, about 200 feet off the water for uh, three uh, different deployments. We track Russian submarines all over the world. Last P-3 just retired uh, last, uh, last year. And, uh, but in any event, that's what, uh, that's what I did. I loved doing it, loved doing it, loved serving in that role. But it was uh, actually the opportunity to use the GI Bill to attend graduate school, to get an MBA at the University of Delaware that brought me to the first state. And when I arrived here, I wanted to find out what VA benefits and resources were available to me and, frankly, to other Vietnam veterans. During my very first week, very first week, I remember leaving class at Purnell Hall, got in my uh, Volkswagen Carmen gear with a rebuilt engine, and uh, drove up uh, <laughs> Kirkwood Highway to all the way to Ellesmere. And uh, oh, that's where I, I walked into a, a, the VA hospital. It was a World War II relic of a hospital underfunded, sorely in need of investment and modernization. Staff morale, to be honest with you, was low. And the quality of care left uh, a lot to be desired. The young dentist who provided care for me uh, urged me to find care somewhere else as soon as I could. In the years following that first visit, I became ever more determined to help transform the VA hospital in Delaware and frankly other VA hospitals around the country into more welcoming places where high quality healthcare was the rule, the rule, and not the exception. 
Today, in no small part because of the efforts of our congressional delegation, led by then-Senator Joe Biden, the Wilmington VA Hospital is no longer a World War II relic. It's a world-class health center, led by Vince. Vince, may stand up and take a bow. Surrounded by a highly trained staff who come to work every day anxious to help our veterans and their families receive the care that they have earned and that they deserve. Community-based outpatient clinics uh, in central and southern Delaware now serve hundreds of veterans every week. And earlier this year, a veterans home in Milford, Delaware, began offering dental care to the veterans who live there and some other veterans who live in the surrounding area. This issue of access to quality health care for our veterans is personal for our presidents, it's personal for our first lady, and it's deeply personal for me as well. Many of those from our generation who served in the Vietnam War were exposed to Agent Orange and ultimately became ill. Two decades later, Congress, with the strong support of our congressional delegation led by then Senator Joe Biden, passed the Agent Orange Act to provide care for the hundreds of thousands of Vietnam veterans who were exposed to that toxic herbicide in Southeast Asia. I believe that many of us would agree that it took too long, far too long, for that bill to be enacted. But finally, Congress did the right thing. And Congress has done the right thing again this time as well for post 9-11 generation of veterans with the enactment of the PACT Act. I'm gonna be really blunt with you. That would not have happened without President Biden's leadership and his clarion call earlier this year in the State of the Union for Congress to care for those who have borne the battle and suffered because of their exposure to toxic burn pit. His leadership was the key. In the, uh, the, in the military, they, they teach us from our trained us early on about leadership. And uh, it's something I've thought a lot about in my life, and I know others here have as well. But leaders have the courage to stay out of step when everyone else is marching to the wrong tune. Leaders are aspirational. They appeal to our better angels. Leaders restore hope and make sure that those who need help, those who deserve help, learn how they can access that help and change their lives for the better. And with that, I'm honored to introduce uh, to all of you a purveyor of hope. Think of that, a purveyor of hope, a leader for our country, a Delawarean who obviously needs no introduction. He's the 46th president of the United States. He's our friend. He's our friend. And his name is Joe Biden. Tom, thank you. Please uh, sit. Tommy. Uh, I always call, I've been calling Senator Carper Tommy for 40 years, and I call him Tommy in the morning. Who, who are you talking about? <laughs> I'm talking about my buddy, a dear friend, a combat veteran, a guy who serving in the Senate, and he gets it. He gets it. And uh, that's why he's hosted events like this for decades as a U.S. Senator and before that as a Congressman. I also want to thank Chris Coons. I'm going to use this mic if I can. Is this one working? I also want to thank Chris Coons and Congressman Lisa Brunt Rochester. Thanks for their friendship and their leadership. And John Carney, you're doing a hell of a job, pal. But. Uh, <laughs> I have only one regret. He used to work for me. He left me became governor. What the hell? I mean. <laughs> and General Barry, uh, thank you for having us today. It means so much uh, to me. For, and uh, I must tell you, uh, um, I, I, I ride by this building a lot, Yadian Air Force One, to fly back and forth to Washington and wherever I'm going. And uh, it always leaves me a little bit of a lump in my throat. My wife's last warning today, when I, she, she's still in Washington, where 
There's 1,200 people showing up at the White House uh, beginning noon, and they're going to be a little late. But uh, um, and uh, she said, "Joe, don't get emotional." Not that I ever get emotional, <laughs> but it, it means so much to me, uh, and it meant so much to Bo. Frank Vavilo is Bo's adjutant general and a great friend, and I want to thank General Vavilo as well. And what I want to do. There's a guy here that flew 25 missions, 25 missions in World War II over Germany. First lieutenant, young guy, 102 years old. Ray, and guess what? He lives in Ellesmere. And my claim to fame is, I used to be his county councilman. <laughs> Ray, thanks for being here, pal. You're the best. You're the Thank best. You so Thank you. I may be Irish, but I'm not stupid. <laughs> I married Dominic Giacoppa's daughter, so you know I got a little Italian in me now. You know. <laughs> the uh, but it is remarkable. Ray flew 25 B-17 bombing runs during World War II. And I might add, one of the Distinguished Flying Cross. <laughs> Ray, you were part of the, uh, was referred to as the greatest generation. But there's no generation in American history more than this present and recently past generation that have been deployed more, have given more than the generation represented by the people we're going to be looking at and honoring today. No, nobody has been in a situation where they show up for their one deployment, then two, and three, and four, and sometimes five and six. One of the last times I flew into Iraq, I went up in the cockpit, and they fired me what's called a silver bullet when they fire the president, and there's a special container in the plane they stick in. And I went up with a, I went up with a group. And I was telling this to uh, Bo's father-in-law and my grade school friend who's sitting right there, and he's taping it all, but he's going to use it against me here, <laughs> Ronnie Oliver. But, uh, and I said, how many of this your first uh, uh, deployment? Nobody raised their hand. And the, and, the, and the crew was in there as well, the, the flight crew. And I said, how many second deployment? deployment? Nobody raised their hand. Third, three, fourth, two, fifth, four. Doesn't happen very often. And these kids keep going, getting back up. One percent. One percent of them defends 99 percent of us. One percent. And uh, I think uh, that doesn't take a single thing away from the World War II veterans' generation, but I want to tell you, it is, uh, it is, it doesn't go noticed enough. How many of you who fought in Iraq and Afghanistan and all through these last wars we've had, how many mothers and wives and sons and daughters sat at that empty birthday, saw that empty chair at the birthday party? And the difference is, a lot of you in my, my generation, on after on December 7th that we celebrated, the bravery of all the, on the, those who showed up. On the Finnegan side of the family, four brothers, every single one, volunteered the very next day on Monday to join. My uncle, Frank Biden, joined. My father was working in the shipyards. The fact of the matter is that, um, you know, uh, it wasn't a second thought. It just showed up. And it was a generation represented by you, Ray, that. Uh, doesn't look for uh, accolades. You know, I, uh, my dad, when I got elected vice president, he said, Joey, Uncle Frank fought in the Battle of the Bulge. He was not feeling very well now, but not because of the Battle of the Bulge, but he said, and he won the Purple Heart. And he never received it. He never, n n n n he never got it. Do you think you could help him get it? It will surprise him. So he got him the Purple Heart. He had won it in the Battle of the Bulge. And I remember he came over to the house, and I came out, and he said, present it to him. Okay, we had the family there. 
I said, Uncle Frank, you won this, and I went to peace. He said, I don't want the damn thing. No, I'm serious. He said, I don't want it. I said, what's the matter, Uncle Frank? You earned it. He said, yeah, but the others died. The others died. I lived. I don't want it. So it's like a generation, this generation, in Vietnam, or excuse me, in, uh, uh, in Iraq. I was up on one of the points, and they asked the, the C CO asked me if I would pin on a silver star, because a young man on one of these points had, had one of his colleagues shot, fell down about, I guess, equivalent. I was, I was out there at the point, and out, it was, uh, I guess, about 150 feet, not straight down, but a hill. And this young man climbed down the hill, put a guy on his shoulder, and brought him back up and was shot on the way up, and he got there, and I went to present it to him too, and he said, I don't want it, I don't want it. He died, he died. You understand what I'm talking about, don't you? It's real. So these are women and men who are enormously consequential to not only the physical safety of this country, but the character the character of America. It's who we are. It's who we are. You're the blood, bone, sinew. You're the backbone of America. And you know, uh, we have a, my colleagues have heard me say this for a long, long time. We have a lot of obligations as Americans. We only have one sacred obligation. Obligations of the old and the young to educate, to take care, but only one sacred obligation. Let's prepare those we send to war and care for them and their families when they come home from war. And I mean that, and I know my colleagues, we mean that from the bottom of our heart. Reason I call Dennis, who's one of the most qualified people I've ever worked with in Washington, and to ask him to become, the, head up the VA nationally, is that um, I was like all of you in the VA over here, and get a phone call. My husband, my son, my daughter is really in, in trouble. She got to come in, got to see her. Well, she'll be able to come in in 10 days, two weeks. More people have died from suicide. Suicide suicide than any other cause in the last three, five years. So I called Dennis and said, can we fix this, pal? That was a start. We increased the federal budget larger than it's ever been increased two years in a row for the VA because we owe it. We've reached out to docs, nurses, specialized surgeons to come in to the VA, expand the expertise. There are good people there, they're all good people, but to increase it. And I think we're making progress. I think we're making genuine progress. And you know, uh, um, I think that there's a, I've been in and out, not as uh, obviously combatant, but in and out of Afghanistan, Iraq, and his areas 38, 39 times. As, not as president, only twice as president, but from the time I was a senator, but particularly when I was vice president. And, um, you know, uh, it was pretty clear to a lot, there was a lot of discussion, as some of you remember, about these burn pits. You all know what a burn pit is? It's a hole between eight and 10 feet, as high as 12 feet deep, the size of a football field, a great big rectangle. And every damn ugly thing in the world is burned in it. Everything, everything. Toxic way, everything. And I'm no doctor, but it's pretty clear, a lot of guys and women getting sick. And so, you know, uh, one of the things is these uh, poisonous chemicals, jet fuel, and some places, some other things I won't mention. 
a toxic smoke, thick with poison, spread into the air into the lungs of our troops. And many when they came home, many when they came home, had gone the best trained, fittest warriors in the world and came home with headaches, numbness, dizziness, cancer. Remember Bo Cole and saying he, how I said he collapsed on a run? Well, you know, Bo's father-in-law, as I said, Ronnie Oliveira, my friend, is here. So are several members of the Guard who serve with Bo in Iraq. This is personal to them and it's personal to all of us. And it's not unique to me and my family. So many are here today and around the country. Secretary McDonough can tell you we're determined, we're determined to do something about this, come hell or high water. And I mean that. I made it real clear to the United States Congress, if they didn't pass this damn burn pit bill, I was going to go on holy war. Not a joke. And I want to thank, we had we to thank someone for this that helped a great deal, it's not here, John Stewart. John Stewart <laughs> made a gigantic difference. And Dennis and others and I went to, on, the, on the Capitol steps with groups, and maybe some of you were part of that. Thank you. And you were there, you stayed there, and you insisted that they vote on it because some of our friends were not willing to do this. But you insisted. And finally, finally, you know, they stepped up. It was part of my agenda that I announced in my State of the Union message to rally the country together. Beating, I, said, they, I mentioned four things. I said, number one, I thought, I tried to find things that everyone could agree on in a nonpartisan way that were critical. One was dealing with the opioid epidemic in America. Two was tackling the mental health crisis, which is real in America. Three was ending cancer as we know it because we're making significant progress and in investing billions of dollars now to find cures. And thirdly, was support our veterans because the need was great and the number was in the billions. Well, I delivered that speech in March. In August of this year, the Bipartisan Pact Act was on my desk to sign the law. And it's one of the most significant laws in our history to help millions of veterans who are exposed to toxic substances during the military service. And you know, and it got done because veterans and families, some of the families here rallied the nation, rallied the country to get it done. After I signed the bill, some of you may have seen the picture because we played on television a lot, I handed the pen over to the widow of the child, Sergeant First Class Heath Robinson, a beautiful little girl. Usually you hand the pen you sign with to the lead sponsor of the bill. And I handed it to her and she held it and looked at she gave me a kiss and said, thank you for my daddy. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is, uh, that family suffered a great loss, but turned their pain into purpose. So other families wouldn't have to experience the same thing. And that's courage. That's character in my view. And that's who we are. That's what defines us. We're the most unique nation in the history of the world because we're the only one that's a product of an idea, not geography, not religion, not ethnicity, an idea. We, the people, hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women, we've never fully lived up to it, but we've never walked away from it. And the people who's protected the most are you people sitting in front of me. You know, <coughs> we learned a horrible lesson after Vietnam how the harmful expect, uh, effects of a Agent Orange. And a, a new generation, understandably, doesn't focus on that very much. But you know the biggest problem with Agent Orange? It dropped on a hell of a lot of people's heads. They got all kinds of illnesses, but they couldn't prove it. You had to be able to prove it. You had to have the scientific background to be able to dig in and prove it. Well, because of Tommy and because of others that we're serving with at the time, we insisted that you don't, if you, all you have to do is prove you were impacted by, it landed on your head, figuratively. No, I'm serious. Nothing else to prove. Nothing else to prove. 
Because why should the burden be on the victim to demonstrate the problems they've suffered since then? And because of that, Agent Orange, when other people weren't suffering those things. So, folks, <clears throat> that's why you heard me say earlier that, you know, when Tom and I supported the Agent Orange Act, that was hard to believe, Tom. That's 1991. You're getting old, man. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Supporting veterans exposed to harmful substances like we saw in Vietnam. Now the PACT Act brings us one closer to fulfilling that sacred obligation. It empowers the VA to move more quickly to determine if a veteran qualifies for the benefits of the law. And the benefits are real. They're real benefits like exposure screenings. If you came back and you're uh, and not in a bag, but in a uh, walking, you came back, you're exposed, you get the screening. It means new facilities, new research, more healthcare workers at VA hospitals. And for families who suffer the ultimate loss, it means potential access to life insurance, tuition benefits, home loan assistance, monthly stipends. And it's real. It's not small. It's what we should be doing. It says that, for example, if you're a spouse of a surviving veteran who died, or a veteran who died from a toxic illness with two children, you could be eligible for $2,000 a month to help with those children. It'll never make up for the price, the piece of the soul you lost, but it is important, those kids. I was talking to someone a little bit earlier without naming them, and, uh, you know, there's tuition benefits. If, in fact, you go to a state university, your child, the child of someone who's died, then you get free state tuition. If you go to a private university, you get up to $26,000 a year. It matters. You qualify for VA home loans. You've, and, and just the bottom line is, you all know it, many of you know it, many of you are victims of it. When you lose one of the breadwinners, it leaves a gigantic hole. And when that hole is left because they served all of us, we deserve, they deserve to have it filled or try to fill it. So passing the, Pass Act, the PACT Act was the first step of being, making sure that we leave no one behind. We also need to pass the bipartisan government funding bill so we can deliver on the law's promise. There's a little bit of a, anyway, you hear it in the press. <laughs> I wanted to come here today, but I got to go back quickly today to sign a few pieces of legislation. But during this PAC Act week of action, to spread the word that every veteran or surviving family member knows how access to these benefits are made possible. The law, and because of these conditions, have already taken such a toll on so many veterans I have directed the Department of Veterans Affairs to treat all 23, all 23 of the presumptive conditions in this law as applicable immediately. I'm urging all veterans of these decades of war to enroll in the VA health care to get screened for toxic exposure and to promptly file your claim. And for those who may be watching at home because the press is here, visit va.gov slash PACT, P-A-C-T, V-A dot gov slash PACT, P-A-C-T. And like you heard from Secretary McDonough, the VA will move as quickly as possible to resolve your claim and to get you the benefits you've earned. Here at the Bo Biden National Guard Reserve Center, where Jill and I stopped to say goodbye to Delaware as we we're about to be sworn in in Washington, D.C. to take our oath of office it is an appropriate place from my perspective and Jill's to be able to continue to push for implementation of this PACT Act. And there's no place, there's no place I'd rather be today to get the message out about the PACT Act than home here and here in this particular facility. God bless you all. And may God protect our troops. Thank you. Thank you. And 
If you hear a plane flying over this facility, it's me and Air Force One. <laughs> I've got to go down. I've got to sign the first piece of legislation that just got passed. And I'm supposed to do that about 2 o'clock. And, uh, and anybody who wants to come to Washington, me, jump on. We're going <laughs> to. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank all of you. Appreciate it. Thank you.